Welcome to If Only You Knew, where each week we take a deep dive into the careers and experiences of people from different backgrounds, cultures, countries and ages to discuss pivotal moments in their lives and the lessons they have learnt along the way. If they told people the truth, they wouldn't last very long. Whether you're a school student, in an established career, mapping your academic pathway, searching for the perfect career, looking to change careers or just plain curious, then this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Christy McCormack, and I want to ask you, what would you do differently if only you knew? Today, I'll be speaking with Brianna Fisher, who's over 12,000 kilometres or 7,500 miles for those international listeners away in North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Brianna is the founder and creative director of Made in Vancouver, an online magazine celebrating Vancouver's creatives, makers, doers and dreamers. Welcome, Brianna, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Christy. Okay, so you describe yourself as a pragmatic brand strategist who is like a marketing Swiss army knife. Why do you describe yourself in this way? You know, I I started describing myself in this way when I got to Vancouver. Uh, And the reason for that is that marketing here is a lot more segmented uh, than it is in Australia. So everyone here can sort of specialise in one area. So what I wanted to uh, convey is that I'm a generalist and can do anything <laughs> so, uh, as, uh, as we do in Australia. So, yes, yeah, that's how that came, came about. So what is it about branding and marketing that inspires you so much? So much about that. What inspires me mostly is the idea of how marketing sort of comes to the intersection of art and science and uh, creates opportunities and builds platforms for people to achieve their dreams. And that's what I think is fantastic about the industry is that there's this awesome fusion between technology and creative practice and then business uh, acumen that all sort of swirl around and create cool things. So uh, that's what I like most about it. Now, talking about business acumen, you recently graduated from Griffith University in Australia where you studied a graduate certificate in business administration and you now live in Canada. So were you in Canada throughout your recent studies or did you move there after you graduated? No, I actually just moved to Canada in March, <laughs> just as uh, COVID, the whole COVID situation was sort of really uh, taking hold of the world, uh, was when I boarded a plane. <laughs> so, so no, I, uh, I started my studies and completed them when I was in Australia. I did them online through Griffiths, so I didn't ever set foot in a classroom throughout the entire uh, grad cert course. So that was, it worked out well for me. So what brought about the move to Canada? Well, it, it had been in, on the cards for, for about a year. My partner uh, was actually made redundant in Australia and about this time oh, in, in March last year. And so he's being a Canadian-Australian. We thought, you know, as you do, you weigh up your options and we thought, you know what, Vancouver looks like a good choice right now, you know, for something different, but also because he was working in construction and so which was an industry that wasn't doing very well even at that time. So that uh, was uh, what sort of prompted the, the discussion. He came over here in about June and uh, got, got to work. And then so as a result, you know, in Australia, fixing every, finishing everything up. So uh, I was planning on coming over here in, in around May, but uh, with everything that sort of happened, <laughs> we moved everything, brought our plans forward further. Wow. Now, Canada was on my 2020 holiday destination. I was even um, studying a bit of French to be able to go to French um, Canada, but I've never actually considered moving halfway across the world. How difficult is it to sort of decide that you're going to do that? Um, You know, for me, it was really a simple choice because there was the imperative around my partner's employment situation. So, and also my own to, to some degree. So, for us, it was a fairly s- sort of simple choice. But also, as a child, I was actually raised in the Middle East. And my parents both moved internationally <laughs> at a you know, similar age. So uh, as it turns out, I'm just sort of kind of walking in their footsteps in some senses. So, But in a, in a, I guess, kind of a more conservative way in that I didn't move to <laughs> somewhere where English isn't still the first language <laughs> as spoken. So you know, for me, it, it wasn't really a hard choice. That in some senses, maybe I didn't think enough about it. I don't know, but <laughs> it's you know, I guess you only have one life, so you have to just go for you know, take these opportunities when you can. Absolutely. 
So what sort of opportunities are available in Canada? Yeah, uh, well, from an economic perspective, uh, the Canadian economy is a lot bigger than the Australian economy and by way of diversity. So there are a lot more opportunities across the different and broader sectors than there are in Australia. An example of that would be, you know, forestry and manufacturing are a lot bigger here than what they are at home, back home. So for me, in marketing, technology sector is particularly thriving in Vancouver so that was an area that doesn't really isn't isn't particularly strong in Australia as it um, as it is over here. So how different is it doing business in Canada as opposed to in Australia? Well I'll have to let you know (laughs) (laughs) but uh, you know it's that there are some differences so uh, the biggest difference that I can think of is the way that their fi- like the financial sector is structured here so people still pay with checks for some things and that's to me something that you know is a huge difference and really stands out but otherwise yeah you know the being a lot closer to the United States as well that's a big driving force in business in Canada too is you know managing those sorts of you know relationships and doing you know, that sort of stuff so yeah you know but so you speak uh, about sort of being in in Canada and moving over there at, you know during the sort of the start of the COVID-19 pandemic but you've been lucky enough to recently secure a new role with a tech company Oli Order in Vancouver so congratulations on that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Net, what's that role going to entail for you? For me well the company is really new so it'll be a really ex- it's a really exciting time to join any tech company but Oli Order in particular. The reason is that they're basically developing efficiencies within the hospitality sector, so which is which also operates quite differently to uh, how we do how we do things in Australia. So in BC, in particular, the government there's a fair deal of government involvement in the um, alcohol sector here. So Oli Order just basically simplifies everything for through the ordering order management and also inventory processes for both sides for the brands alcohol brands and breweries, cideries and so on, as well as uh, restaurants and the buyers. So, yeah, it'll, so basically what my job will be, will be to uh, create the content um, and develop the brand. That's there. exciting, especially for a brand new um, brand. So are you looking forward to, to getting in there and doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So they've been in business for a little while. It's, it's like such an awesome story. I'm looking for, really looking forward to digging in. So uh, what they do, the, the brand itself started, was developed by a, a son of a winemaker here who noticed that his mum was spending so much time invoicing all of the restaurant, you know, invoicing all of her buyers. So he just wrote some software to make, uh, make her life easier. And uh, that's just sort of grown legs and grown. And, and uh, now today there's Oli Order, which is really cool. So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's an exciting time. Absolutely. Now, speaking about exciting times, you've just recently been working on your own business uh, called Made in Vancouver, which is aimed at helping to nurture and rebuild Vancouver's economy in a meaningful way. Could you tell us a little bit more about that initiative and how it all came about? Yeah, so, um, well, when I arrived in Vancouver, it was at the start of the, of the, the sort of real lockdown. So as a result, I went from living on a property in the Northern Rivers with my parents and having acres of space to moving into a 75 square meter apartment that I can't leave (laughs) so uh, it gave me a lot of time to kind of reflect and consider my position and also what skills I have so and how I can put them to use and so Made in Vancouver was kind of grew organically through that sort of reflection on what I do what I can do and how I can contribute to uh, particularly the creative industries here that and as they are in Australia, are probably the hardest hit of all industries, of, you know, notwithstanding tourism, but in the sense that they were the first to shut down or to be shut down and uh, they'll be the last to reopen fully with events and theatres and so on. So all really struggling, live music and, and all, of, all of these sectors are having a really hard time. So I uh, may developed or this idea of creating an online magazine called Made in Vancouver to really celebrate artists and makers and doers and dreamers and just all these people who do great things for our community every day but may not uh, feel have have avenues to build and promote themselves so that was how it came about. That's a fantastic initiative and you're getting ready to launch 
and how supportive have the local businesses been with this? Yeah, really good. Like, so uh, it's been really well received so far. So it'll be exciting to be able to launch it. So yeah, you know, everyone is is really positive about the opportunity to talk about their businesses, but in a way that's not more conversational rather than, uh, you know, sort of a t- typical interruptive kind of advertising route that, that a lot of people go with here. So it's exciting. Like, yeah, it's just exciting really all around. But I've got some friends helping out in developing the articles and, and doing big things. So it'll be, it's good. So it sounds like you're going to change the, the way that businesses get their word out. Oh, look, I, I wouldn't say that. I think that generally um, content as a whole or the way that people look at promoting and building their businesses is changing. I think as audiences become more aware and busier too, they're not really that into the traditional kind of interruptive marketing approach. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't want to say that it's evolved, but it's just not gaining the traction for the cost that people are uh, that business, but that brands spend. The idea of delivering value, which is ultimately the basis of content marketing, is to keep delivering value and more value until customers come to you rather than the other way around. So, so it is a bit of a mindset shift in that sense, but that's, that's in part what makes the magazine so exciting to me, at least, is that it um, provides that sort of platform, a ready-made platform, so to speak, so that there's that space there that people can talk about what they want to talk about which is cool (laughs) sounds very exciting now starting a new business is pretty tough but you're in a completely different country how have you found that you know it's pros and cons (laughs) so Mm -hmm. I sound different here which uh, was something that I had kind of underestimated actually the the strength of my Australian accent which is when I'm at home normally people don't talk about this Mm. and that's that's not to say that it's you know because obviously everyone has an Australian accent at home but more so mine's a bit more of a British accent so it's like it's a bit weird and uh, but but what it's done here in standing out you know it's I've sort of attracted this sort of group of people that have been like in, interested in diversion and inclusive practice and, and equity and all of these really interesting and huge issues that uh, just sort of come out of the woodwork. And I, so I don't know, you know, like as a, re, as a result, how it's been in some senses starting a business here because uh, I've kind of just attracted this sort of tr- this wonderful tribe of people just by being different <laughs> than everyone else. So, you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really happy for you that, you know, they've embraced you and embraced the ideas that you've come upon. So that's fantastic. Now, like the fallout from the pandemic is going to be felt for a long time. How do you believe businesses in the community can come together to start repairing some of the damage that's been done? You know, I think that businesses really just have to dig deep and and really connect with their values and what what they offer in a real sense, not just in the the top level marketing sense, really just sort of have to nut down into what it is that drives their consumer, their one target customer, and really break that apart and kind of go, you know, what is it? What is our actual, the actual value that we deliver? How are we making their lives better? And I think that's really how businesses need to approach post-pandemic activities is to sort of take that step back and say you know what we need to instead of being brand to consumer communication we need to be more like human to human communication and sort of change the way we're talking as a brand and meet our customers where they are yeah definitely I think you know the pandemic has definitely seen people want to have that human element back into things so yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's a really big uh, a strength of small business in particular is their ability to pivot and to be human and authentic, so to speak, because I sort of I find that, you know, the idea of an authentic brand is being fascinating because we often forget that people are behind brands, you know, that brands, an, an organisation is not something that is separate to the humans that are in it. And I think that's really important to reconnect with at this time that, you know, organisations are part of our community 
and uh, because they're the people <laughs> that live here, you know. So I think that's sort of going to be more and more the future of marketing is that more one-to-one and organic communication. So you mentioned earlier that you moved from the Northern Rivers, from Acres in a beautiful part of Australia to, uh, you know, a small apartment in Vancouver. How did your mind need to shift during that time? Oh, you know, in in so many different ways because, you know, it's not only that you move into a small apartment, so it's like the operational kind of factors of doing that, like going shopping and you have to have a little cart that you unload your groceries out of so that you can take it up the lift, you know, in one go. Like there's those sort of things which take a bit of getting used to. But it's also the the stuff, you know, there's, there's just so much, you know, in, in a normal time, you know, if it wasn't COVID, then it wouldn't be so much of an issue, I don't think, because, you know, I haven't even really been able to get out and around and explore Vancouver, you know, <laughs> because yeah. it's only just starting to reopen. So it's really different and requires, yeah, like, I, I I must admit I have found myself really longing for kind of for conversations and talking to people because you know we talking doing Zoom chats and all these different things is is a different way of communicating and now more so with with masks coming in and stuff I I personally do find those sort of things to be hard to kind of get my head around mm-hmm. being an extroverted person not being able to see somebody's face like and smiling and how they're responding is like it's exhausting (laughs) um, you know there are a whole lot of mind shifts like mind like mindset shifts that you have to go to uh in just moving from a house to an apartment let alone a a house internationally to an apartment (laughs) where you don't even don't know anyone aside from your partner and his family oh that's tough did you ever consider coming back to australia did you get a little bit homesick thinking i should maybe you should just go home through this whole crisis Look, in some senses, yes, and in some senses, no. You know, like I, I must admit, when I do feel homesick, I, I, I'm lucky to have the Triple J app. <laughs> so I can just sort of always bring a little bit of home with me, you know, which is awesome. So, you know, it's totally different time. I think back to, you know, when we lived in the Middle East as, as kids, you know, we were really cut off. Like there, there was no sense of Australia or no sense of home with us there and you know in the 90s obviously and now we have so much technology and so many things that um, make life easier and you the, and the world smaller that it doesn't really uh, factor in anymore to me anyway <laughs> so that, and there's so many Australians in Vancouver you really <laughs> when I eventually oh, find really? them and leave the house <laughs> <laughs> you just have to go seek them out <laughs> yeah so as a brand strategist, do you think that you sort of had to change your own brand in a way? Yeah, I certainly had to uh, differentiate it. So, you know, in Australia, as I say, marketing is a little bit different. So you, you're generally, you're a lot more generalized in your marketing practice in Australia. You are expected to be uh, a digital marketer as well as the traditional advertising style marketer and everything in between, doing social, doing everything, you know, whereas here uh, that's there's a lot more of a segmented approach. So I have in turn had to find ways of explaining that I know how to do everything. You know? <laughs> um, and certainly being a, a new media artist, I do know how to do everything. So, you know, that's hard to kind of, that's hard to communicate. So as a result, yeah, I, I did sort of take the approach that content um, generation and um, marketing would be sort of my niche, my, my little swim lane here. <laughs> now, you've done a graduate certificate in business administration. Now, that sort of gives you a bit of a 360 view on business because, you know, no one can be an expert on everything. You might be a fantastic brand strategist, but, you know, business is, is different running your business. Have you found it easy or difficult to ask for help in the areas that you're not as proficient in? You know, it depends on who I have to ask. I think would be the asterisk I would have to, have to preface that with. You know, I think generally you, it, we all like to think that we are experts and that we know everything in different, at least in certain areas. I think that having studied so many different things, the, the, I really understand that I'm never going to be an expert in, in even marketing, in, in even one thing. There's always, everything changes. We're always in flux and there's always more to learn. And 
what I love, one of my big beliefs um, that comes from my artistic practice is this idea of relational aesthetics, which is um, basically we, we learn and we find beautiful things in conversations that we have with each other. And we learn and grow through those conversations because we each see the world differently. And so, you know, I'm not afraid to ask for help because if I don't ask for help, then I'm going to miss a whole heap of understanding that I could have otherwise had uh, about, you know, about anything. You know? <laughs> um, one of my favourite questions to ask people is, you know, what do you see that I don't about any issue, you know, particularly where there's conflict, conflict involved. It's like, well, what do you see that I don't see here? Because, you know, there's so much in life that, yeah, you'll, you'll just miss out on if you're too proud or too, you know, perhaps stubborn or any number of things, reasons why you might have a barrier to asking for help. Yeah, I love that. And to be able to take on other people's perspectives is such a, a great skill to acquire. So, um, yeah, it's hugely important, you know, that, uh, yeah, the, the, it's you have to be able to encourage a diversity of ideas, particularly in marketing, but in anything, business, in anything. If you're going to shut out any, like, if you're going to shut out different people's perspectives on a particular issue, then you're going to find that, particularly when you're dealing with customers that, well, humans, you know, that, (laughs) that, you know, that things might not turn out the way that you think. So it's important. So to be able to reach out, I suppose you're creating a network and you, you may already have an established network, but how do you go about building that network to be able to find the right people to ask the right questions of? That's a really good question. You know, I personally just, I don't know how I do. I just sort of start, I guess I I found, I have found LinkedIn to be a wonderful platform for that. And in particular, just going through, reading a lot about different industries, about different companies, and just being open to having conversations. You know, I I don't, I'm always open to having a conversation um, with anybody about anything. So <laughs> to me, that's uh, that's how I just build my networks. And it tends to be, you know, also, I suppose the asterisk around this is that I'm also open to understanding that, you know, people will come into my life or come into, whether professionally or personally, who were put, maybe meant to be there in some senses of the term that, you know, that I'm also not for everybody. So we all just sort of find our own tribe is, is my view and that people come in and they come out of your life as, um, as uh, not as required, needed. but, you know, <laughs> as it just happens. Definitely. Now, you've, you, as I mentioned before, you spent some time with Griffith University, but that wasn't your first foray into academia. You also have a bachelor's degree in new media arts, photo media from James Cook University in Australia. Could you tell me a little bit about that degree? Yeah, so New Media Art degree was really before its time in so many senses. So I had some wonderful lecturers within the sheltered isolation of North Queensland <laughs> where we and my, my classmates, I guess, um, would be the right term, just explored different digital practice and customer experience designs and all these different things. So specifically, the degree is in interactive design, which is a form of communication or graphic design and photo media, which is basically digital photography. So basically taking analog practice and shifting it into the digital, but exploring a whole heap of theory along the way. So the degree itself, as a result, was kind of, you know, seen as kind of lesser in some senses back in 2011 when I did it, (laughs) when I started it. And it's sort of when since moving to Vancouver, I've really sort of gained an appreciation of how wonderful that degree was because digital communication and and customer experience, especially in the COVID era, is kind of priceless right now. <laughs> and so it's it's uh, you know the degree I I loved every minute of it. And uh, I would go back in a second, but sadly, JC, you cancelled it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I already graduated, so, you know. <laughs> well, you've got something no one else can have, so that's great. <laughs> yeah. How did you balance, though, being such a creative person? And obviously any university degree is, you know, stacked full of theory. So how did you balance your desire to fulfil the creative side with the theory that you needed to learn to be able to grow you know, for me, I, I suppose I'm more on the theory. I was more on the theory spectrum when I was at uni because I had been a self-taught designer 
for a period of time prior to entering the degree, I uh, already had that kind of artistic aspect to my practice. So what I was interested in was more of the theory and gaining that foundation and kind of credibility as a designer to sort of build my own platform from. So for me, I really enjoyed the theory part of it and exploring the ideas more so than exploring artistic practice itself. So did you go straight from school into university or did you have a little bit of a break in between? No, I jumped straight in. So yeah, I jumped straight in with law and economics, which was kind of the brainchild of my dad, but also people throughout school and everybody else. Like I was in this high school debating team. I did, you know, all of those things, the career advisor. I I was particularly opinionated in high school and everyone was kind of like, you know what, you'd make a great lawyer. (laughs) So, So that was where that came from. And, you know, in, you know, it's, it's, I jumped around and yeah. Because I did found, find your story really interesting as you did start your university education with a Bachelor of Laws and Economics. Then you changed to a degree in nursing, biomedical science, psychology, education and chemistry before graduating with your Bachelor of New Media Arts. So why so many changes? That's a really good question. (laughs) You know, I had so many changes because in part, like because I'd gone straight from uni into, sorry, straight from school into uni, I hadn't really considered that seriously that what this idea of having to have your whole life mapped out by 17, you know. So I sort of just jumped on in and uh, saw it as just this learning journey that, and, and basically extension of my life at school. I was working at the same time at, as being, you know, studying full time. So it just sort of was something that fit in and kept my brain stimulated. And that kind of was the asterisk around changing courses was that if I found one particular course that I'd kind of absorbed everything, I kind of felt that I needed to in understanding that the profession probably wasn't going to be for me. So uh, there was that that sort of dual kind of criteria that I had going on. Was I still interested in this and is this something I could see myself doing forever? Because we do tend to think when it comes to university or further education that it is a forever issue that we're talking about as opposed to just a, you know, this could be my career for now kind of, you know, idea. And so I jumped from, yeah, law and economics into nursing, into business, into education, biomedical science, doing all these, like, trying everything as I found, like, I would go to different lectures with friends and be just like, oh, my goodness, this is fascinating. And that would tend to, that would tend to be, you know, the kind of, you know, I guess, stimulus that I needed to kind of change degrees. So. <laughs> It probably, you know, but what can you do? In in hindsight, you know, we all do crazy things and make like when we're kids. But for me, it it sort of sent me on this trajectory of lifelong learning that it, you know I've really enjoyed. So I think there is a huge amount of pressure on young people, you know, to know exactly what they want to do at seventeen, eighteen, nineteen years old. So how much do you think being able to sort of jump around has benefited you as an adult in your career and your life and and just the skills that you've acquired? Uh, I think it's really benefited me a lot. I think that, you know, that I've found in various moments of my life this sort of being able to approach different topics from a more informed space and certainly a more mature mindset, particularly for, through my learning in law and economics, but also in business and more recently biomedical science. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, university itself, it's not necessarily what you learn specifically, it's learning to learn. So, you know, there's, a, there's an expectation that you really only retain around 20% of the information you learn in a degree program. So, which is part of what makes it so fascinating. It's more about teaching critical thinking skills rather than necessarily the the subject matter. So for me, yeah, you know, I I think it's informed a whole heap uh, uh, and certainly continues to inform how I approach problems and uh, with a willingness and an openness and also the understanding, as as we spoke about earlier, that I'm never going to understand or know everything about any topics. So conversations and being open to them are the most important thing to me. So how supportive were your parents of all the changes or did they just freak out every time you changed subjects or did you hide it from them? 
Oh, look, I, I, I don't remember having too many conversations with my parents over my <laughs> career, my choices in, uh, in uni. But, you know, I think they sort of came around that they, they were, you know, that they were concerned about whether or not I would actually ever finish a degree. But I think also, that, and my hex debt, of course, was a, was a big, big yeah. factor in their, in their concern. But no, I think that, you know, my parents were initially really like, you know, you'd go to do law and economics, you go and get a great job, you know, and all those sorts of things. And sort of looking past, in some senses, my more creative side, and that sort of the idea that you can develop a career in the arts. So my mum, that those sort of seeds were planted. And then my mum actually got a job as a general manager in the arts. So that sort of, for me, it was fortunate yeah. <laughs> that when I ultimately came to study in New Media Art, there uh, wasn't so many barriers at that time. And I think that they were just sort of happy that <laughs> it looked like I'd finished. <laughs> Finally so get out of uni. <laughs> what advice would you have to young students who want to change direction or who don't really know what path they want to go down? Um, you know, I think just cultivating, I, I would say, because I, I actually spent a fair deal of time at university, working in the university, teaching academic skills to postgraduate and also undergraduate and PhD students. And what I would say is to spend some time cultivating your reflective practice uh, or basically cultivating your reflection skills. So the idea of thinking about yourself and why you're making decisions and what interests you as a person as separate to what interests everybody else and what everybody else thinks. Because I think that certainly um, my choosing new media art as an example of a, as a career choice people at that time and you know I remember walking around the university campus and people like paying us out because we're just the art students that are floating <laughs> around making stuff pretty you know <laughs> and then but you know what was fascinating is that the med students and the you know nursing students and business students would all be coming over to the new media area to you know, whether it was to play their own instruments or just come and see what we were up to or doing those things. It was a real meeting space in this melting pot. And now that degree, you know, people around the world are looking to new media artists to develop customer experiences online, animations, video, you know, all of these things are what new media artists do. So, you know, it's ultimately become a skill that was that's really highly regarded and it's still in the arts, you know. So I would just encourage students to reflect and consider what it is they want to do without that kind of weight or bias of what other people might think is more valuable than something else. I think you make a really good point because I think, you know, the art sort of degrees were sort of looked upon as a bit sort of airy-fairy, but now they're the basis of so much growth and learning that people are able to do. And it's, it's a bit strange, but law degrees now are looked upon as the old arts degrees, which is completely strange. So, Yeah, absolutely. A law degree is just your uh, platform to go become a politician or something, you know. Um, generally, research shows that, that, that legal practice is at risk of becoming automated. So there's a whole heap of different kind of issues there, you know, that Law is an incredibly competitive field, you know, that's hard to differentiate because the law is the law. So in terms of a lifelong career choice, you know, unless you're going to be at the top 1% of your class across Australia or, or you know, or the, wherever you are studying from, you, it's going it can, and can be difficult to develop a career in that space. But yet we do sort of have this sort of idea that it's somehow more valuable than that student that's going to do anthropology and learn about you know different cultures and the way that humans interact and all of these sort of more softer skills that enable you to do so much so yeah you know I I think that it's that people should just consider what they're doing and what their reason for existence is. So looking back are you pleased now that you did the degree that you did? New media, yeah, yeah. I'm pleased with all the degrees that I, I've started and the ones that I finished. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. I certainly wouldn't be the person that I am today if I hadn't had explored, explored opportunity and possibility. Do you think that your undergraduate degree lived up to the expectation in the real world that you had whilst you're at university? Yes, 
I do. I think that it's funny because I don't know that the institution had the faith in it that we did as wow. students, you know, because the institution, you know, generally speaking, universities do come at, like, it's, it's a business decision from them in terms of what degrees that they offer. And I think that new media kind of fell into this bucket of, we'll we'll give it a go, <laughs> see how it goes kind of thing. And uh, I was really lucky to, to study uh, under some really pas- incredibly passionate and incredible new media artists and and thinkers you know so for me yeah it it was a great time and I wouldn't change it at all. (laughs) So what made you move into postgraduate study what did you want to achieve out of that? Uh, Just a continuation of learning for me I think that at that time I'd sort of fell into this trap of of, uh, sort of what you were talking about earlier about whether you could know everything And, and I felt that at that time, I didn't know enough. So I, it seemed like a natural progression to go on into postgraduate study. I also have this ambition that sort of sits there in the back of my mind about one day being a doctor something. So <laughs> a doctor, you know, doctor of philosophy or whatever award exists at that time. So for me, it, it seemed like just a natural way of expanding, continuing to expand different ideas. So I went into postgraduate study as a, into a master's of design management initially, which was an online course uh, through RMIT. And it was fascinating. I loved it, but it ended up getting cancelled, so I had to change. <laughs> oh, wow. I wondered why you changed. So, yeah, did they just cancel it mid, yeah. midway through? Yeah. They, so they, I got an email one day just saying, like, you know what, we're not going to continue with this degree program. You can change into um, some other one. And I was like, I don't want to change into another one. I don't want that one. <laughs> I want this one. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, that was that. So, I, you know, I, I initially I was, because before I went on to, to do that, I was thinking about just sort of staying the track at JCU and going through to just to master's there. But I, in design, but I'd sort of looked at the RMIT program and thought, no, design management, that's what I'll do. And so, yeah, it, it didn't work out. <laughs> now, you've, you've started your MBA journey. Do you think that you're going to continue and, and finish the full degree? Uh, yeah, I'll go back at some point. I don't know if I'll go back to Griffith or if I'll end up studying at a university here. It, it all depends. But certainly the MBA, an MBA is possibly becoming less valuable than what it was 10, even 10 years ago. With so many self-made entrepreneurs and digital tools, it, it kind of, in, in some senses, you know, isn't as essential as it once was. But I have really enjoyed and did really enjoy the grad cert program and the learning more about, you know, finance and people management and all of these things that I hadn't considered before. And sustainability, uh, which is Griffith Uni's strength, was a subject that I loved and innovation. Like there's so many, there's so many subjects that really speak to me as a person who exists at the, the interface of art and science that you know that's that the MBA program offers because you can do all things in an MBA you don't have to be you know really I initially when entering the MBA program I thought oh my gosh you know I'm not a numbers I'm not a particularly strong in numbers person I'm I've done bookkeeping but I don't enjoy it so I'm probably going to have a hard time (laughs) in this program but you know what I'm going to do it and uh, as it turned out it's not so much that anymore it's a lot more practical it's a lot more thought you know thought based it's not so much like you need to do this skill and demonstrate your practical skill so yeah I think that I will go back and do it fantastic now you've said the older you get the more you realize that downtime isn't laziness and it's important to maximize productivity why do you say this and how long did it take you to come to that realization it took me a really long time (laughs) Um, to come to that realization you know I think that laziness you know taking downtime and especially in in this you know this sort of COVID era is really important I think that people can often think that you know say as an example when you're working from home that you are to be working you're productive 100% of the time and that any other time that you're not specifically in front of your computer typing as an example is time that you're basically floundering (laughs) and I think you know I think that we as a culture and as a society really underestimate the value of thinking time and reflection and finding you know efficiencies 
just exploring, ha- having a bit of space to explore an idea. I, I think that's where some of the best innovation and creativity comes from is through those downtimes, through finding time to be bored. And, you know, yeah, like a, so as a result, yeah, I really do think that we do need to find more time to relax, more time to switch off and more time to be bored. Uh, so that we can sort of find solutions to those problems because we're sitting in front of a computer all day wishing that you will sort of somehow miraculously solve a problem, you know, sitting here, you know, uh, staring at a computer screen may not work. Look, I think that you make a really good point there with, you know, being able to have the time to think. So do you think when you become an employer and you start to grow your own business, do you think that will change the way that you treat your own employees? It certainly shapes it. I've always been, when I have been managing staff, I've always taken the view that they should be given, should be empowered to develop and grow their own ideas and take them to their full and logical conclusion. Because I think that's important. I think that, you know, when people are given the opportunity to experiment and to shape their own destiny in some senses, you know, obviously within the the boundaries of the organizational values, but I think that that wonderful things can happen. Basically, magic can happen. You know, like mm-hmm. I, I find it really informative that organizations like Google provide their staff with time to work on their own side hustles during, you know, company hours effectively. And the reason why they do that is because it, it encourages their employees to be innovative and to take that innovation into the workplace. So if you can't find ways of, of creating platforms for your staff to achieve in whatever way they want to, then they're not going to, you know, like people aren't going to be monkeys sitting in front of a computer, you know, and just hacking away all day, every day and find that fulfilling. They've got to connect to something greater than than, than just the, the, the operational nature of a task. So, yeah, absolutely, it, it informs everything that I do. Now, you really are making magic with your Made in Vancouver magazine and I think, you know, kudos to you to be able to go into a a new country and to really support the local community and economy and local businesses. So I can't wait until that gets launched and we'll be making sure that we'll um, have a link to that on our uh, website as soon as that comes out. But I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. But I've got one last question for you, Brianna. What would you do differently if only you knew? If only I knew. You know, I I don't know I would do anything differently, but if but now that I know, I, um, <laughs> I plan on, uh, you know, being a lot more, I guess valuing my own voice is something that I think is, is something that uh, I, I plan on doing a whole lot more of and trying to find a balance between the effort it takes to speak up and say something versus the impact so that but that my saying something might have so (laughs) so there's two (laughs) things there that I would do if I knew excellent now I really appreciate you taking the time and when the borders reopen I really hope that I get to fulfill my dream of coming over to Canada and I'll definitely be popping by so take care and I hope that we can speak soon Absolutely. I look forward to seeing you. (laughs) If you'd like to know more about Brianna, you can follow her on LinkedIn and more information will be available on Brianna and Made in Vancouver magazine on our website, if only you knew podcast.com.au. Thanks, Brianna. Thanks so much, Chrissy. For more information about our guests or our show, visit ifonlyyouknewpodcast.com.au. 